I, I would like to uh, gavel the open session back in session, and I think we are getting ready um, for the next presentation, which is the second part of what I told you was going to be this two part, two presentations related to the Institute's intramural research program. And I've already explained what a blue ribbon panel is, and I see one of the co chairs, Lynn Jordy, at the podium, so I'm just going to turn this over to Lynn. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am going to do the first half of this afternoon's presentation, and then I will turn the podium over to my co-conspirator, Dr. Gail Jarbick, to do the second half. So by way of background, uh, the intramural research program of each IC, uh, as Eric mentioned, is required to undergo uh, a review by an outside panel once every 10 years or so. Uh, so this was actually the third uh, blue, rib blue Ribbon Panel Review of the IRP uh, since 1993. So a panel of uh, eight scientists was convened. And these are people uh, with broad expertise in genetics and genomics, uh, and also who have uh, reasonable knowledge of the NHGRI. Uh, here is the panel membership. So Dr. Jarvik and I co-chaired. Uh, also on the panel were Greg Barsh, Lon Carden, Chanita Hughes-Halbert, Gigi Lozano, Carol Ober, and Neil Risch. And as you can imagine, uh, with a cast of characters like this, we had a lot of lively, very constructive discussion. So really a great team. And the team wouldn't have been a team uh, without Susan Vasquez. Uh, is Susan back there? <laughs> Oh, just stepped out to do a logistical thing. Oh, there she is. Oh, she stepped over there. There's Susan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, really, Susan did most of the hard work, uh, so uh, she deserves all the acknowledgement we can give her. So the process, uh, as Eric mentioned, this began a year ago at council meeting with an announcement. Uh, we had five virtual meetings uh, of the panel, uh, three of them this year, one in February, a couple in April. Uh, we also met virtually with a number of the IRP faculty members. Uh, these were one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with various members of the Blue Ribbon Panel. Something that was very useful in the process were the five white papers uh, that Charles mentioned. These were really meant to outline big questions uh, to be addressed by IRP leadership and faculty. Uh, so that, that was an extremely useful informational item for us. We also had a two-day in-person meeting in Bethesda, uh, December 8th and 9th. And then today, we have our presentation uh, here at Council. Now, our overall assessment was highly favorable. Uh, I think we all felt uh, that the IRP has been doing uh, very well scientifically. The science is outstanding. Uh, just one useful statistic, 1,260 publications authored by uh, the 72 IRP faculty over the last five years. The staff and faculty in our assessment work well together. And I have to say, everyone was very responsive to the various questions uh, that we had. Uh, one of the things we were curious about was the extent of interaction among IRP faculty. So we asked for an interactome graph that you will see in the report. Uh, within a few weeks, we had that graph. One of the th things that it shows is that 30% of the publications authored by IRP faculty are co-authored with other IRP faculty. The leadership in our assessment is appreciated and well-respected. Uh, and across the NIH, because we met with a number of scientific directors from other ICs and members of other ICs, uh, their view is that the IRP is innovative, forward-looking, and broadly collaborative. So for directions, we recommend continuing uh, the trajectory of really groundbreaking genomic research 
developing and applying approaches, approaches, as Charles mentioned in his talk, for the prediction, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of disease. The IRP has been, I think, very effective, very successful in their studies of rare diseases, uh, not just uh, uh, basic research, but also treatment of rare disease, and we recommend that that continue. But also to expand the genomic investigation of both rare and common diseases, because really uh, they inform one another uh, very effectively. We also recommend uh, that the IRP really lead uh, the development of omics approaches uh, to understand both rare and common disease, and also to promote collaboration uh, across the NIH uh, and also with other institutions throughout the United States. Now, a question that comes up here, as with many institutions, is the appropriate balance between basic and translational research. Uh, and this is, I think, especially important right now as uh, some of the faculty involved in translational and clinical research uh, are uh, closer to potential retirement. And uh, so uh, this is an issue that we think uh, needs uh, to be considered very carefully uh, in maintaining uh, the right balance between basic and translational research, both of which, of course, are very, very critical. Another thing that uh, we discussed at some length was additional ways in which to take advantage of the NIH Clinical Center, which you've heard about uh, this morning, because there are vital resources, samples, data that we felt could be utilized uh, more effectively uh, by the IRP. And of course, all of this then relates to recruitment. Uh, we recognize that it's very important, of course, to recruit outstanding scientists. That goes without saying. But I think especially in this atmosphere, we felt that uh, team players uh, are very, very important in the, in the recruitment considerations. And as faculty retire, uh, <clears throat> the IRP needs to continue the uh, tradition of collaborative, translational, and clinical research, uh, but also at the same time taking advantage of the resources that exist here and have been built. Uh, and again, we emphasized uh, that recruitment uh, should really seek out those faculty who can bridge uh, any gap between basic and translational science. And with that, I've concluded my half. Yes, we'll collaborate by having me take over. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the next topic is collaboration. And, um, you know, as Lynn referred to in the report, there are these beautiful collaboration networks because when we were evaluating the collaboration, we really didn't have a sense of this. And so this was one of the many times that we turned to Susan and said, like, uh, help and get us some data, and we were really presented some beautiful data with an impressive collaboration record. But we did have a few recommendations, and one was to increase the collaboration with the All of Us research program. It seems like such a natural fit for NHGRI. There's so many opportunities within that program. We'd like to see those a little bit more aggressively pursued. Um, the other uh, thing, um, and I think I mentioned this in another slide because we had trouble binning some of our recommendations that uh, data sharing within the intramural program uh, should be an increased value um, and is something that should be promoted by NH Drive given their track record for data sharing. Um, and then data science was a place where there could really be leadership from the NH Drive throughout the whole NIH, um, and we recommend continuing to work in that direction. There is beautiful education efforts within the IRP as well as extramarily, and we think that maybe a stronger relationship between those two efforts would be useful. And then collaboration of a different type, community engagement, talk to the community more, um, community, or community hospitals, community healthcare systems, try and find ways to interact more with your local community. Moving on to diversity. 
I mean, so much has been done, and Charles has been obviously an amazing leader in this area. Um, so this is just continue, yes and, continue to work in this area, workforce diversity, recruitment training, research participants, all the things that are already being worked on, just keep that momentum going. And then community engagement is another place where there's an effort toward diversity because you are in a very diverse community here in this area. Okay. So the Blue Ribbon panel felt very strongly that all data should be shared, including IRP data, including data that is outside of NHGRI, but in the um, clinical center, um, we think that the same rules should apply to all investigators, whether they're intramural or extramural. Um, we were concerned, frankly, about some of the retiring uh, faculty or you know, imminently retiring faculty who have really amazing sets of patient data. And we wondered how that data is sustained for future investigators. So we wondered about the possibility of a biorepository so that data sets would not be lost when investigators retired or left for other reasons. We were presented with these five proposals for new initiatives, and the um, Blue Ribbon Panel was particularly excited about the idea of a Center for Genomic Data Science. This would allow development of computational scientists. We also liked the idea from a separate proposal to sequence um, NIH Clinical Center patient participants, and uh, we would bracket that with if the data can be shared, because we understand this, uh, of course, uh, has uh, non-NHGRI patients as well. We think that there needs to be leadership in integrating genomic data into commercial electronic health records, and we thought this was one opportunity for the intramural research program. Obviously, diverse and inclusive professional development is a critical part of training that's already a focus and should continue to be a focus. Mentorship training opportunities for faculty and senior staff could be further uh, supported. And there is the opportunity to build capacity for measuring the success of training programs. Um, and it's very hard to track out trainees over time, I think we all know, but um, a more, uh, in, more infrastructure could be dedicated to that. So that takes me to the conclusions. It was a pleasure to come in and be the external reviewers of a highly successful program. It makes your job easy. It's a very impressive program, and I was personally very glad to um, learn more about it, as I'm sure I speak for the whole panel. The faculty and the trainees are highly productive. The science is amazing. There is already a built-in strong dedication to diversity and inclusion that is going to be further furthered under Charles's leadership. Really wonderful leaders, and the group looks forward to the next 10 years, and we will tell those of you who will be called to review in 10 years that it was really a pleasure. So I don't know, if I know that Neil from our group is online, and I don't know if Neil has any comments to add. Well, you guys, as always, you guys did a spectacular job. I really don't have anything else to add, thank you. And uh, thanks to you, Gail, and to Lynn for your leadership also. Thanks, Neil. Any questions then? And Lynn, if you want to come back for questions or take them from there. Nancy. So I'm not sure, but I think I remember part of the thing that we did the last time was think about the particular challenges that the intramural program would be likely to face and what, you know, what kinds of thinking you might um, take on in advance so that you can meet those challenges well. I'm curious how you thought about that in this and what you see as the danger points for NHGRA intramural going forward. Yeah, I'll start and then let Lynn and maybe Neil throw in, which is, you know, one of the 
incredible challenges is the budget is very limited for the amazing work that's being done. And also there's a lot of sort of regulations around who can be replaced when and how. Um, and so that's just an incredible challenge. We did not have <laughs> a particular solution to, but I think that the leadership has done a really good job of putting that into their planning. So that's been a significant challenge. I, I do think you know, the other challenges are um, data sharing challenges and um, you know, very specifically like the NIH isn't like doesn't have a data agreement with all of us like my institution does. So there's things that can be worked on there that's come up um, that each individual investigator in the IRP has to get, they can get the data obviously, but they have to get it independently. Um, there, there's just a lot of structural sorts of things like that that we learned about. Lynn, you wanna help me? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, another thing that has been alluded to already today is just the cost of living in this area. Mm. Uh, that is that is a challenge in recruitment. Uh, and where I live, housing prices have doubled in the last five years, so I, I feel it too. Um, but at the same time, we felt that there's so many advantages to working at the NIH. Uh, Long-term support, uh, that was mentioned earlier today, uh, for projects that uh, the extramural program might never fund. Uh, a relatively high level of job security uh, and, and the opportunity to collaborate with some of the best biomedical scientists in the entire world. Uh, I, th I think those are all very, very important selling points. You can see why we were put on this panel together. <laughs> Carl, maybe I can add one thing about you know, in this slide here too. So it's probably already you probably already tell in reflection from some of the comments that, and Gail pointed this out, that probably the biggest issue is the budget. You know, a, a confined budget, which makes it challenging to grow and to grow into new directions and so on. And I think that's so what's reflected in our report is we've talked a lot about what can the intramural program almost do uniquely, you know, given their situation, their setting, and their faculty and so on. And that's why you heard discussion about, for example, the local community. It's you know very large African American community in the D.C. area. There may be some really unique opportunities there. The clinical the, the clinical center. You know we talked about the uniqueness of the clinical center and how the IRP can have a major role in that. And also Gailman just talked about the fact that it's embedded within the NIH and there's genomics all over the NIH these days. It's not just the IRP at NHGRI, which provides and it's been reflected some you know great opportunities for collaborations and. You know, Lynn and Gail just said, that's what makes it a very special opportunity for anybody who wants to come there, whether it's a postdoc or investigator or whatever. And so play to your strengths. I think that was a lot of what we had talked about and, and our, your, your unique opportunities. Carl, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I think, again, for me, it's very interesting that somebody who's coming into that role, um, <clears throat> one, one of the things that is, is really important is as a faculty, you tend to look at your program, but as a scientific director, you have to look at everybody's program. And one of the things that was pretty, uh, has become clear to me is that there are things that happen across the board that the scientific director doesn't really have that much uh, opportunity to influence. Uh, i give you an example. When Recently, two of our branch chiefs retired. You know, one would think that that money would become available for the scientific director to bring in new blood or even to hire a, a new branch chief. What happened in this aspect of the intramural program that is completely out of the control of the scientific director, even the IC director, because they come down from NIH wide process, you know, like what you have to pay into the clinical center whether you are utilizing it or not. So before you know it, your program is getting smaller, but the money is not available to you to bring in new blood. You know, to me, and I think to Dan Kastner, and I'm sure Eric, when he was a scientific director, it has to be the major source of frustration and very level of difficulty uh, you know, for, for us to deal with. And then you have things like stipend going up, you know, Things can be mandated from Congress, but the money is not in the budget. You know? So if you say give off federal employee 5%, which is fantastic, 
but if you don't give me the money, basically what you are doing, you are cutting my program. Uh, you know, so so there are there are things, you know, things like that. And then NIH intramural in program, or actually both intramural, is a true federation. All institutes are independent, uh, and but there are things that we try to centralize to go. But it usually takes a lot of effort. I can, you know, to, so for me as, as a new scientist, I try to bring that up every time we meet. I say, how can we do things better? How can we centralize, you know? Data science. How can we centralize sequencing? I can, so all of those things are real, uh, real challenge. Uh, you know, in terms of the uh, administering the intramural program. Yeah. Nancy, the perspective I'd put on this, <clears throat> if I think back, it's about 20 years ago is when I became, when I took over the intramural program in Charles's position as scientific director. You know, and I, you know, and then I think about 10 years ago when you were a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel Review. You know, what's changed in 20 or since 20 years, 10 years. You know, it's the cliche, oh, to be young again. I mean, it's it, when the intramural <laughs> program was much younger, just in its life cycle, not even so much age, but just in its life cycle, its seniority, of a, it, it just seemed we were much more nimble and had much more available. I mean, the big difference between now and 10 years ago, for example, is we have a, a very, very successful former scientific director, Dan Kastner. With, he's hitting on all cylinders, but he stepped down from a leadership position, and, but his lab is still in a program. The same with our clinical director, Bill Gall. We love these folks. They're incredible. But you can see what's happening. And then we have, you know, even have Francis Collins in our intramural program. And so, so it's just this, so we have, it's very hard then, you know, budgets really need to go up before we can um, uh, really free up a lot of money, do a lot of things. And, and we need younger people. We need more junior people. We need more junior. We need the Thomas guy. Right, right. We need, we need the junior. And so that's that to us. That's the that's that's a that's sort of a, a huge challenge. And it, it really runs through the recommendations because the Blue Ribbon Panel suddenly realized that I mean, if all of a sudden or when you know when Dan Kastner, Bill Gall, if and when they retire, one we need to replenish their clinical physician scientist expertise. Otherwise, we're going to have you know everything's going to drop out. In terms of that, but also they're leaving behind some very valuable biorepositories. We need to take responsibility for patients. We need to take responsibility for. So again, it's um, oh to be young again. I mean, it was life seems so much simpler 20 years ago versus 10 years ago, and now we've got a whole different circumstance within the faculty that brings a lot of stresses and strains. But so I have to ask, as a contributing thing to that solution, to a solution to those things, is there any thought to revisit the? The things that started out as because of the cap on federal number of federal employees that became you know this um, need to outsource oh. so many NIH. I mean, the use of contractors. Sta you, or, to, yeah, so, use so, of contractors. So that actually waxes and wanes sometimes in predictable ways from administration to administration. Sometimes in not as predictable ways. But there's sometimes where we're we're obsessive about money, and sometimes we're obsessive about true federal positions, and sometimes we're obsessive about both. Right at the moment, we're probably less obsessed about federal positions. So in fact, we are building up our federal workforce a little bit more at the institute to save money. Because we because it we, is because we because it isn't right, savings. Right, that's the no. I mean that's it my is point savings. is right. that was such a an unnecessary drain yes. on finances as a way to do business. Yes, although much. of course the flip side of that is when you have a very large federal workforce that you lose some nimbleness because those person those people have permanent positions, yeah. which is a plus and a minus. Yeah. But so in any case, it's uh, it's it's just at a different life cycle stage, and um, and but. It's lots of challenges, but I think the Blue Room panel picked up on many of these and really I think are very helpful for guiding Charles in what he has to do next. I see Howard Chang's hand is up. How, Howard? Yes, I want to thank the panel, the Blue Ribbon panel, for their assessment and uh, sort of their positive evaluation. Um, I wonder if this uh, report will also be seen beyond NHGRI. Does it go to the director's office and um, does that help in any way in terms of then resources that can be brought in uh, to deal with some of these issues like replenishing the workforce? So first answer, it is, it's on the NHGRI website associated with this council meeting. It is a public document as of now. So there's, no, there's total transparency here. Um, I think formally we will send this Blue Ribbon Panel report uh, to Dr. Nina Shore, who is the Deputy Director for Intramural Research. And, and so she sees all reports 
I, I suppose in principle we could send it to the director or the incoming director. I think they'll probably just make sure the deputy director of general research is aware of it. I, I have already highlighted a few sections that I plan to, I, I don't want to, I, I plan to use, I don't want to say weaponize, I plan to use in a productive fashion to make points because these, these, these reviews do get high level respect because you know, it's a good group and they're a good perspective and blah, 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 very thoughtful, took a year to do it. So there are a number of things I've already thought of ways to use in productive ways and I'm sure Charles will do something similar um, as, as appropriate. And you know, I think the other thing that goes on around the scientific director table is um, uh, they will, you know, whether it comes up at a blue ribbon panel or other advisory groups or site visits is when they start picking up common themes of problems. Sometimes when you hear it two or three times from externally, then it gets a little more momentum than if it's just heard randomly by, from one institute. But it's absolutely fully public and will be used. I'd love to believe to get used to get more resources. I'm not as, not as optimistic about that, um, but, but we will use it every opportunity to help um, make things as productive and, and reduce challenges as much as possible. Neil? Yeah, I, I, listening to this, I have a, a, I guess I have a question. It's really for Charles and for you, Eric. So um, when I came to UCSF uh, almost 18 years ago, I was given some resources to build the Institute for Human Genetics, but it wasn't a great deal of resources. And by that, I mean some space and positions. But we ended up hiring something like 30 new faculty. Of course, this was all done by partnering and, you know, partnering with other departments and so on. And I think you know, there are both advantages and disadvantages. We ended up with like sort of a hub and spoke. So we have a core group in our space, which is our Parnassus, but we have many people who are not in our space, you know, who are actually at the other campus, they're actually more at the other campus at Mission Bay now, which has some potential disadvantages because of cohesion issues. But this, I know you have individuals, in, and you talked about this uh, in the intramural program, or even directors of other institutes. And I'm just wondering the degree to which when you're in constra you know, a constrained budget this way, you know, how do you view this? How do you view you know, the possibility of partnering, whether it's with other, other IRPs and other, in, in, in other institutes and so on, as another way to build so the genomic workforce at, at, um, at NIH with still the NHGRI IRP being the hub? Yeah, so one of the ways that I've tried to explore that across the NIH is through some of our core facilities, for example. And, and that is, there are in other institutes that come to use our, res our core resources, for example, and we are developing ways now to adequately cost that uh, so we can do some cost recovery and also to let other institutes know that we have this kind of services that they can indeed utilize instead of replicating all of us having our own program uh, in terms of cost savings. Uh, so that's one area. Another thing is um, the, the issue of uh, sequencing. Our sequencing center, the NISC, also it's not just for NHGRI, it's an NIH-wide you know, enterprise, and there are more true costing in that regard and collaboration across the, uh, across the NIH you know, in terms of bringing resources to our own sequencing program. So we, we are utilizing our cores uh, to engage, you know, in, engage other ICs and to share resources so that we can create efficiency, you know, in terms of the various calls that we establish instead of everybody having their own uh, silos everywhere, you know. So that is, that is one area. The other thing, and again, that is actually quite helpful in terms of the Blue Ribbon Report is, again, the thinking around the data science. Um, you know, I, I think it's a real um, a wonderful endorsement of what some of the things that we're already thinking about uh, in terms of how do we take our faculty to the next level in terms of expanding uh, computational biology infrastructure, you know, and data science, and, and even the whole notion of, you know, data sharing to bring that under this umbrella of, um, you know, interaction. But, Neil, you're absolutely right. The challenge is, and that's what I'm discussing with Eric and our faculty, that's why I challenge us. I say, let's look for a way to raise, to, I mean, to identify, you know, $5 million dollars uh, so we can indeed begin to bring in new blood and even hire the you know, director of like this data center. So these are all sort of challenges, um, but also create opportunity, you know, in terms of um, how we want to take our intramural program forward. 
So Neil, uh, I, I, but my question: do, do you ever like do joint recruitments yeah. or co-recruitments? So, so, what, what so, so let me let me try to answer. I think Neil was also curious about: do we ever do joint appointments? So, ah, so okay. Charles, in his presentation, talked about we have 12 adjunct faculty. So right. we've actually been much more so than other institutes. Some institutes don't do this at all. We, we give out what are called adjunct faculty positions, which are folks that have primaries elsewhere. And it's, it's mostly honorific, but we give them access to our cores. They come to faculty meetings, they want, blah, blah, blah. So that's sort of a lighter version, Neil, that I, what I know you're talking about are classic joint appointments like you have in academia. Those don't seem to work very well in the intramural, part. occasionally you find an example where this works okay, but you end up with, you almost, instead of, inevitably, you're ending up with two bosses and two oversight boards and two of this and two of that. It's never really worked well, and it always seems like it starts, you have conversations, and then when you get into the details, it just doesn't, there's just not very many good examples of it. But Neil, you put your finger on it, it is why we have been, you know, we love taking institute directors for the most part, um, the, 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 because the, you know they come expenses paid by their originating institute. We don't pay, we we pay, but we don't pay with money. Um, but I mean, we you know it takes a lot of effort on our part. Um, but it allow it, it allows us to be bigger than our budget. And you know, you know, Lindsay and Diana and Josh and Gary Gibbons and previous to that, the Gary Nables and the Harold Varma said, this is awesome, right? I mean, we loved, and, and we're a very attractive program to come into, one, because of our science, two, because we're really good, we provide a good home, as you've seen. So that's one way that we, uh, and in fact, Charles, I don't know if it's not a well, it's not, it doesn't have to be a secret. I mean, when, when we recruited Charles here, and I even think to this time, you get it's a little bit of support from another institute. Yeah. Um, and so there are examples of this where you can, on a case-by-case -case basis, get a little bit of a joint feeling of that. But that's, that's you know, I always say an HGRI punches above its weight intramurally because of our ability to attract all these institute directors to make us big, not on our dime. And then we punch above our weight around this table through the common fund, where we're overachievers in the common fund especially in the genomic space, but it comes on their dime, and it comes on our, our work, but it's their dime. So that helps a lot. That's why we have a bigger impact than our $661 million budget. But Eric, is it not true that when the institute director steps down as director from that institute? You're right, they shrink. Yeah, we, we lose that, right. If it is, but then okay. you're supporting them if they're staying no, here. No. no, well, no. I mean, the short, the, 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 like when, um, well, I mean, like when, when Betsy Nabel, departed, um, you know, we, we no longer got the money. You, right. you just asked for a scenario, what happens if Diana Bianchi would step down as institute director, wanted to keep her lab going? That would actually enter sort of, uh, that would enter a space that is not currently covered by a legal document, but, <laughs> you know, but we are actually trying to make sure that does get done. Um, so, you know, but, but that, is, that is a very good point and, and that we, we also are trying to protect ourselves from having a, a budgetary challenge associated Risks. with it. Yeah. Right, a crisis. So, so it, by and large, that has not bitten us and we've recognized that as a vulnerability and we're actually working to, to fix that to make sure it's very clear what should happen. And we've certainly learned from the experience none of the rules were set up for an NIH director to have a, a, you know, the whole thing with Francis both going and now coming back has all been sort of new and we've been trying to protect ourselves the best we can from having it be a problem, but it's, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, just, just to add, Neil, I think um, I may have misunderstood your question, but just to add another complexity to what Eric just described is these are federal, some of these people who are attached to other IC directors and things are federal employees. Now, if there's no good arrangement, like Eric is saying, then NHGRI will have to take these people in and their salary. And they may not necessarily reflect the way we want to go in terms of our research program. So there are also federal rules and regulations that we have to abide by. Um, and that's why sometimes the contracting process is a little more attractive. Um, but once it's a federal employee, then you have to deal with that person. Um, you know, so, it's not always an advantage, you know, in terms of this, at the university level, it's a pure advantage to have these collaborative, you know, activities. Uh, but given the federal rules and regulations, it can be indeed challenging, um, you know, in a sense, yeah. So I go back to given the budget and the regulations, they're doing an amazing job. <laughs> Uh, 
other? Lynn? I'll just mention one other thing that came out uh, in the review process. Uh, when we talked to some of the people outside NHGRI, uh, they said, you know, we, we feel like we'd like to know more about the IRP uh, and how we can collaborate and benefit from those collaborations. You, just to clarify, you mean others within the intramural program at NIH, but not at, NI, at, not at NHGRI? You don't right. mean outside, the outside of NIH? Exactly. Yeah, you mean other intramural leaders at yes. other institutes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, something we recommended, and I, I think is very important, is that, uh, Charles, as is, is you continue, continue your leadership role, that you communicate that. Uh, uh, you're, you're a very effective communicator. So I think this can continue to enhance the collaborations uh, between the NHGRI, IRP, uh, and people at other institutes. Right. All right. I, I, again, for me, that is music to my ears, and I think it's something that I think it's really what we have to do. I think the challenge sometimes is really this federation structure, you know, and, and the people want to remain in their own little silos, you know, here and there. Uh, but I think there's a growing understanding, you know, that we have to share resources uh, at, at the minimum so we can bring down costs, uh, you know, of, of, of doing things. So any opportunity I get during our scientific director and clinical director's meeting, I always bring up this issue of how can we work better together, um, you know, in terms of moving our whole program, you know, forward. Recently, there was a call from the um, DDR, you know, Nina Shaw about five, you know, wanted us to make a suggestion about a, a court crossing project across the NIH. Um, and one, one of the ones I, you know, sub submitted was this sequencing of everybody that comes through the clinical center. I, I said, it shouldn't be institute-based. This should be a centrally funded process, you know, that cut across institutes. And so it's one of the things that is being considered. I don't know how, how far it will go. Uh, you know, so to me, I think it's something that we have to do. We have to find ways to work together um, to um, increase the economy of scale in some of these things that we do, yeah. Anything else? If not, I want to profusely, profoundly, from the bottom of my heart, thank Gail and Lynn. I, I, I asked you to do a year-long process. I hope you enjoyed it. I suspect you enjoyed some of it. I thank you, Neil, and other members of the Blue Ribbon panel who I think they got, I mean, I tried to pick people that I also thought some of the things you'd be talking about and strategizing about would be very relevant for what you're doing at your host institutions, because I know many institutions are struggling with the same kind of issues we are. I know we're different, but hopefully you got something out of it as well. My thanks to Susan Vasquez, of course, because she was stellar in her role, and I promised Lynn and Gail that she would be, and I don't think she disappointed. No, I can tell, not the case. So thanks to everyone. Thanks for counsel for your input. And again, um, we will bring Charles back in a, probably a year or two, just, and we'll continue to do so to keep updated. and. 10 years from now, we'll do all of this again. Yeah. Thank you. So, all right. Well, thank so, you very much. So thanks, Lynn. Thanks, uh, you and the panel. Thank you very much. OK, it's time to move on. Uh, next is the uh, National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report. And I've asked Vince Bonham to introduce our guest speakers. And Aravinda and Charmaine, would you like to come up, please? <laughs> 